please know that you are welcome here no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. Pastor John and his wife Judy are away. They're celebrating their wedding anniversary this weekend. And uh, I am honored to stand in for him today. So my brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and let us rejoice in it. And now let us lift our, his name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from there.
Join me in the opening prayer. O Lord, my God, I call to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said to my prosperity, I shall not be moved. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. And now join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture today is from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. It's in your program. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and, when he saw him, fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, 
Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. As this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May God grant his understanding of this, his holy word. fabulous turnout um, at Urbane Cafe on Tuesday. Thanks everyone. We celebrated Vicky's birthday and look how colorful and joyful we all are. And there's a few others. I mean, it was really a great get together. Um, we even got to see Paige and Malcolm and it was just a, a great evening. Thanks everyone. These things really are good for not only the fundraising, but for the fellowship and as for us to get together and um, get to know each other better. Um, pay attention to the date changes for the upcoming book study. I guess June 20th has happened. So where are we? July 2nd will be, which day is that, Wednesday? No, Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. Tuesday okay, don't let me confuse you. Tuesday at 7 on Zoom. I hear it's been very interesting. Ah, we're having a get-together gardening work day on the 13th. Um, come early while it's still cool, 8 till 12. And um, yeah, let's, let's beautify and get rid of some of the dry, dead stuff and weeds out there. And fun stuff coming up at the Hedge Home on July 27th. Time to be announced later. Six o'clock. Um, so put that on your calendar. Um, we still need people to sign up for slides, to glance in the slides and um, bring in goodies on Sunday. Um, don't be intimidated. Some of the goodies have been like a little bit over the top, but really just bring what you can and just sign up. So um, I just wanted to make that clear. And now we will continue with our worship. special music that Michael um, brought to us this week, so we are not alone. Mm -hmm. 
Please join me in prayer. O gracious creator, bless us today with your holy presence. We know you are here with us, for there is no place where you are not. As we gather in your son's holy name, open the eyes and ears of our hearts, illuminate our lives, enlighten our minds, and embrace us with your love. We pray that as you will, we will be healed and be used to heal others in your name. Today's scripture is familiar. It appears in Matthew, Luke, and here today in chapter five of Mark. It is a narrative about the curative power of Jesus, two miracles of Jesus. There are actually three stories to tell this morning. Mark tells two of them First, a story of two women, a girl and an outcast, who desperately need healing. And second, the story of how Jesus responds to their chronic and fatal state. The third story, unwritten, is what it means for all of us here today. At first, this story of the girl and the outcast seems very related. The, the two girls seem, uh, the two women seem uh, to be so different. Uh, one is a young girl, is a child of Jairus, a respected and authoritative leader of the local synagogue. She is surrounded by wealth and has a strong family support system. She is deeply loved and her death would be keenly felt. Although she remains silent, her father advocates for her and makes her case public. On the other hand, the outcast woman is older. Due to her impure hemorrhaging condition, she is socially ostracized and alienated from friends and family. 
She is poverty stricken, having spended all her resources on unsuccessful medical treatment. She is isolated at the far margins of society. Her death would be held little consequence to almost anyone. She does advance her case, but she does it by stealth, becoming her own advocate in the process, and she speaks aloud her truth. Yet, on the other hand, both of these two stories, these two women, share some very basic similarities. Neither one are named. They are both women, members of a distant second class in a patriarchal society, children like this young daughter and widows are held by society in the first century to really be pretty much disposable. Both of them have exhausted any natural or human means of help. They are both anathema to anyone following the purity code. Touching the dead or touching a menstrual bleeding woman would immediately defile upon contact. The number 12 associated with both symbolizes wholeness in scripture. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob, 12 disciples, and indicates their need to be restored to complete health, to complete wholeness. A strong element of faith permeates both their lives, first expressed by the outcast and secondly expressed by the father of the young daughter. Perhaps Mark is telling us in this story of two women that like us, these two are different in some ways, but like them, we are each alike in many similar ways. Jesus, however, loves us all in the same way. Jesus is interested in healing us all in the same way. The second story, the narrative now focuses on the story of how Jesus responds. And there's probably five characteristics that surface in this tale of Mark. First, we see that Jesus, whatever he plans, is not too busy to respond. He reacts immediately and sets off for Jairus' house upon request. On the way, there's an interruption of this outcast woman, and unfazed, he prioritizes the needs of this poor, marginalized person first, and then continues on to Jairus' house. Secondly, Jesus radiates healing power in his very presence. Healing defines his divine nature just as does teaching and salvation. The mechanism he uses is touch, what we know as the laying on of hands. Neither his hymn nor a tassel or a shirt sleeve or any other relic or talisman is the source of his power. And his power is not diminished by its use nor is it subject to delay. Thirdly, notice how Jesus completely ignores the strictures of the purity code. When he is touched by the bleeding woman, or when he is touched, or when he touches the dead child, he's not made unclean. The unclean are cured. The unclean are made whole. Even Jairus, this powerful synagogue figure, steeped in the law, keeps his invitation, even though Jesus has come into contact with the unclean and bleeding woman. Fourthly, Jesus' miracles always point to something beyond immediate healing. In this case, it is the potency of faith over the agony of fear. Remember, in this verses, the fear, the trembling, the falling prone of both Jairus and the outcast. 
he responds with, do not fear, only believe. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace, be freed from your suffering. The child is not dead, but asleep. And finally, fifth, the gentleness of his voice. He calls both women daughter. Now they have at least a family name. He doesn't scold the disciples when they can't answer who touched my garment. Of course, they might have guessed in that crowd, who hasn't touched your garment? He doesn't chide the outcast for touching him. He invites her forward. He doesn't rebuke those mourners who sneer and laugh at him. And then in that beautiful moment in Jairus' home, Teblitha come. In the basic Aramaic language, those words mean, little lamb, rise. Rise, little lamb. Words that are warm, understanding, compassionate, tender, gentle, inviting, and above all, loving. Perhaps Mark is encouraging us in this story to think about Jesus' methods of healing. Perhaps he is ex suggesting that when we serve the ill, when we approach someone that's sick, we imitate him. We treat them as our own beloved child. We focus our attention on them. We're not afraid to use touch. We emphasize allaying fear while encouraging faith. And above all, we're always gentle in voice and tone. Wonderful, wonderful miracles. There is a third story that might have arise, arisen from this reading. It is a story that many of us wish the gospel writers had gone on to write. It is the story that asks, what about the other dying children or the other sick people, the chronically ill that might have been in that crowd or that are here in our lives today. That's a hard story to try to tell. What if it's my child, my grandchild, my niece, my uncle, my spouse, or friend that is dying? What if I am the one that is chronically ill or living with a fatal condition? Where is the miracle then? Where is Jesus then? In most, ans in most instances, the best answer I've learned is probably not quoting scripture, it's not arguing theology, and it's not tossing out such platitudes as, they're in a better place, or everything happens for a reason, or life goes on, or the worst, God just needed another little angel. It doesn't help, it hurts. What I can offer you this morning is some of my own observations over almost 80 years when death has touched my, life, my own spiritual journey. Many of the experiences I'll tell you about have been heartbreaking. They are still hard for me to talk about and they're difficult to listen to, but in the end, all those stories end up with Jesus being there to pick up the broken pieces of my life. Some general observations are that healing is seldom instantaneous. It takes a long time. Jesus is always at work. He takes the initiative 
but he is not on our time schedule. Healing is by God's wisdom. We may desire, we may want, we may pray for physical healing, but what we may be healed instead is our heart, our mind, or our spirit, because God thinks that is what we need the most. Healing transverses death. The Aramaic word for death that Jesus uses means existing elsewhere. Death is not the end. To Jesus, death is a passage to the ultimate healing. Remember that bandit on the cross. Truly, today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Another observation is that sometimes the, on the scene, in the hospital, at the deathbed, the one that needs the most healing may not be the one in the sickbed. In all instances that I remember of sickness and death, Jesus is always up to something ultimately valuable for recovery and for the benefit of God's kingdom. His actions aren't always immediately evident. And often that healing focuses not only on the person who is sick or who has died, but extends out to the people that are left following. Sometimes Jesus' healing is like paying it forward. In my troubled childhood, I had an uncle who was interested in me, he was kind, he was caring, he listened, he always had time for me. He provided extra in the way of material things. When there was abuse, he stepped in and stopped it. He was protective. I grew very, very fond of that uncle. And yet when I was 10 years old, something horrible happened. I knew something was wrong. He had had financial reverses. His wife gave him no support whatsoever. I saw him take what looked like pain pills on occasion, and he seemed to be distant. And then one night, I heard my mother talking on the phone, and she said, well, Dot, you know these farmers, they stay you know, out, out all evening till the moon rises. And I thought, it's February, it's dark, it's foggy, this isn't right. I remembered his pickup out in a field. And so I grabbed a flashlight and traveled out there, hoping to find him. I did. I found him and a 20 gauge. At that time, I suppressed. I tried to suppress all memories. I tried to suppress those images. And mentally, I did a good job at that. But over the years, I seemed to develop this strange compulsion, a strange compulsion first to help my younger cousins be of benefit to my actual nieces and nephews, it extended to other people's children. It extended to kids going off to college. It extended even to untenured, vulnerable library faculty members. Throughout it all, often I was given a nickname, and that nickname was Uncle Mike. And to me, it's still the best name that anyone has given me. It seems that 
Jesus had taken those good memories and he had embedded them in my heart and they surfaced. Now, sometimes when we lose someone, we remember why we were fond of them and we allow their, those actions to incorporate into how we live. Sometimes Jesus' healing means a complete change of your life's attitudes. You wouldn't have recognized me in my adolescence. I was raised in a very Catholic, conservative area. Irish, German, Portuguese, Italians, Bass, and uh, we were, it was very conservative and very anti-communist. The church drilled that into us every mass. I think if they would have turned us loose, we would have probably tried to march on Moscow. <laughs> but they didn't turn us loose to march on Moscow. They shipped us to Vietnam. My high school was in a poor, poor side of town, but it was a patriotic side of town. Almost uh, all of us, uh, I, I joined the Naval Reserves with, as a senior. Lots of my classmates joined up. It was a patriotic thing to do, and uh, I, uh, as I joined the Navy, I was given a four-year extension to go to college and then, then do my active duty, which I did. You know, and the war was going on, and I was, I was doing my duty, and then I came back, and fully, 40% of the guys I went to high school with didn't come back. Uh, some of the 10% of the ones that came back came back in chairs or with prosthetics. And some of them were cousins. Some of them I couldn't recognize. They were addicts. One of my in-laws today is still caught in, in that nightmare. So I took a look and I kept the phrase, blessed are the peacemakers, kept coming to me. I didn't become violently anti-war. I don't argue about what's a just war and what's an unjust war, but instead of a a, a belligerent hawk, I became kind of a merciful dove. So to this day, through organizations like the Reconciliation of uh, Friends, Amnesty International, and our own UCC, I do what I can. I can't stop a war, but I can do something in my own way to help the victims. Sometimes, Jesus will work to change an attitude, sometimes to complete one of the Beatitudes. Having gone through that, working at Northridge, I thought, <laughs> I, I've done my time on Guadalcanal. <laughs> I hadn't, I had no idea. I was happy, I had a good job, I had lots of friends. I was a deacon over at the Metropolitan Community Church in the Valley, and then it hit. The AIDS pandemic hit, and I was in that population group. And all of a sudden, all I was doing was pastoral care. All I was doing were funeral services. One week I did three funeral services. And friends, to this day, I have no friends from that period that are my own age. Um, I stopped counting after 200. I remember one particular friend, a friend I had known from UCLA, a friend who showed up going to MCCV, sang in the choir. I knew him from CSUN as well. Uh, he and his partner and mine, we went to the same gym. We went to the same church. We danced at the same discos. We hopped the same bars. Yes, we hopped the same bars. 
and he was getting sicker. He was hired as a staff member at the AIDS NOLP food bank. I was doing a lot of work there, uh, so we worked a lot on that. But I knew, and it was, it was every opportunistic infection you could name uh, was there, visited upon this singer and poet. And uh, it, was, it was depressing. And then one night, um, Jose, his partner, called me and said, Michael, come on down to Cedars. Uh, Randy's gone into a coma. And part of me was hurt, but part of me was relieved. I thought, at long last, this is going to end. Well, I got down to Cedars, got up to that floor, and he was thrashing around. And I thought, you told me he was in a coma. And Jose said, he is, but he's having nightmares, and he can't wake up from them. And I thought, my God, my God. They gave him some morphine, and it got quieted down. And Jose said, well, could, you, could you just pray? And so I sat there, and I held his hand. And I, nothing, nothing would come. And then I, I glanced up, and Randy was looking at me. And I heard him say, through the Kaposi sarcoma and the thrush and the sunken cheeks and that raspy voice, don't cry, Michael. I'm going to see Jesus. And I thought, what faith. What incredible faith. This is the faith of that woman that was chasing Jesus all over town to touch that tassel. The bonfire of that face reignited my own. And I was able to go on with my AIDS work. And he even bought the appeal for the AIDS walk into this very sanctuary. And it still astonishes me, astounds me of your generosity in that regard. And when I think of that, all those hundreds and thousands of dollars, all those checks that you've written for people you don't know, for a disease that may not have touched your life as directly. Every time I think about that and look at you, my faith is renewed and strengthened. And I thank you. Sometimes in the face of death, we give up our faith, we give in to our faith, but sometimes it's an opportunity to grow our faith. Sometimes death provides unique opportunities, a change of opportunities. And I say that for those of us who have lost the one, um, there's always grief, and I don't think the ache ever goes away. But I think it's sometimes a little harder for those of us who have been the primary caregiver for that person, um, especially if it's long term. We don't realize how many hours that's taking. And uh, it just, it just kind of builds up and builds up and builds up. And actually, sometimes it becomes like, that's one of my main reasons for living. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. And that, that grief is, is horrible. But then you're looking around at the four walls 40, 50, 60 hours a week that's empty. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a partner. It could be a child. Uh, it could be a spouse. You know, it, it could even be somebody you just loved. And I was lost. 
And I had a, a mentor from the UCC who said, uh, Michael, you started out with a calling many years ago. Why don't you see if that's a new direction you should go? You should re-energize all of that. So take some courses. Think about becoming certified. Um, I did. You, see, you can teach your Bible classes. You can teach religious studies classes. You can do sermons. You can do pastoral care. You can do mercy's work. You can help with the homeless. And I did. Um, you folks are the best judges of how that's worked out. I hope that's helped you. I hope it's helped you. It's, it's saved me. Sometimes you find yourself on a new path entirely. And then there's that other situation. What if you're one like that poor outcast woman? You're the one that's chronically ill. You've got a fatal condition. Uh, you look at your age and you see mortality catching up. And for the last seven years, that's where I've been. Osteoporosis, osteopenia, arthritis, a cancer diagnosis, cancer metastasized to bone, and then a lot of other, a lot of other problems. And I don't think it's the pain, at least for me, that bothered. It's the frustration of not being able to do. And I tended to fight that. And three or four months ago, I thought, I'm interested in Celtic Christianity. There's a singer teacher named Deidre Kennedy that comes from the Aran Islands in Ireland. And she comes to town every once in a while. And she puts on workshops. And by gosh, she's doing one down in Orange County at the Sisters of St. Joseph Hospital, a massive, a massive health complex. And so I girded my loins, and I went down there. And it was one of those days where everything got worse and worse and worse. And I got down there to the all-day workshop, and uh, I'm thinking, oh, do you, you know, this is, you know, happy, 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 and I'm not happy, happy, happy. Uh, And at one point, they, were, they said, it's, it's lunchtime. Some of us are going to get into groups. And I thought, the last thing I'm going to do right now is get in a group. I'm sorry. And they have these wonderful, this wonderful garden, meditative garden, all kind of pathways, flowers, bushes that are blooming. They've got rock gardens, trees that are gorgeous, um, fountains. And it's, it's Catholic, so you've got statuary here, there, and everywhere. And so I, I was stumbling along one of the pathways, um, and you know I was I was really getting more frustrated, getting awfully depressed, and feeling sorry for myself, and little flickers of despair. I, it's a place I didn't want to be mentally, and then it starts to drizzle. <laughs> And then the drizzle gets harder. And I see a little pathway, and it's leading down into an alcove overgrown with trees. So I thought, well, that'll uh, that keep the drizzle off of me. So I go down there, and there's a bench. And I sit on the bench, and I look up. And right across from me, full size, is a bronze cross. And on that cross, we're in Catholic country now, of course, is an image of Jesus on, on the cross. And all I could think of was I just said, oh, Jesus. And then the strangest thing, wondrous thing, that's ever happened to me, my senses shut down. I couldn't hear, I couldn't smell, I couldn't see, I couldn't feel, I couldn't feel anything. I just sat there and then from within me and around me, I heard that voice. 
warm, understanding, compassionate, tender, gentle, inviting, and loving. And all he said was, I am with you. And at that moment, the greatest feeling of peace and hope and love surged through me. And a few seconds later, when all the senses returned, that feeling remained. Sometimes that comfort, you can have comfort without an enormous miracle. But that I am with you, I hope if you're ever in need, you will hear those words. And in, or if, if, even if you haven't, you is a personal, singular, and plural pronoun. I think that perhaps Jesus was not just talking to me that morning in the drizzle. He was talking to all of us. I am with you and my sisters and brothers. Believe me, we are not alone. We are never alone. God bless you. invited to write prayer requests on the prayer cards in the pew rack. Or if you're out in internet land, I presume it's uh, write uh, an email to the church. God's overwhelming generosity to us invites us in turn, our generosity to others from the needs and poverty of our own lives, Jesus leads us to true and lasting riches. We are called to give according to our means toward the goal of living and fair balance among all God's children. May our offerings begin to answer God's call.
We pray, compassionate creator, that you will find our gifts of time, talent, and treasure acceptable. May our offerings provide your blessing on all who give and on all who receive. We dedicate these offerings to the coming of your kingdom in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now time for our prayers of joy and concern. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I want to take just a, a joyful moment uh, and acknowledge the musicians behind me, particularly Tim McDonnell, whom I called kind of late last week and actually emailed and said, I've got this song I really like. And I thought, you know, just go to the service and it'll pop up. It wasn't on the service. He had to unlock vaults of music companies, I don't know, all, all over, but he, he got that song, and I appreciate it. The musicians just did a sermon in, their, in itself. Thank you. Thank you all. Gracious Lord, we stand in need to be lifted by your healing touch. In hope, we pray you will clothe us in joy and forgiveness and righteousness. We pray that you will surround us with a love stronger than all our pain, all our doubt, and all our grief. We now lift to you in prayer all of the names of those who are on our prayer list, those who are suffering, and those who are sorrowed. We lift this morning, the names of Maria's neighbor, Marcus, who has, gone, has undergone recent shoulder surgery. And we pray for his prompt healing. We pray for his health care givers to be able to provide really complete and, and rapid therapies that will help Marcus recover. We also lift the names of Ben's friends, Lizzie and Deborah, who are both recovering from, uh, from double mastectomies. And lift um, all, all the women who are in health care. Lift up all the men, all the children who are in health care, that are doctors and nurses and therapists will have the discernment and the wisdom to provide in God's will healing in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that all the vicious, various conflicts unfolding across the world will be visited by your Spirit, that your peace, your love, and your healing will be manifest. Lord, we lift the voices of our brothers and sisters at home, away, and on social media. Lord, we lift the silent voice of prayers so dear, so tender, 
that they are lodged within our hearts. We thank you, God, for your patience and your forgiveness. We thank you for the redemption that makes us whole. We thank you for the unconditional love to recenter our lives. We thank you for bringing us to a new life beyond suffering and death. We thank you for your compassionate and understanding nearness. We thank you, Lord, for we know that like the sparrow, your eye is always upon us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. circle and um, I want to thank Michael again I 
will never be the same again. I have never sang that song, and it meant so much to me. Um, thank you. All right, how are we doing? Okay. Uh, um, yes. Tomorrow's the, lead team. Tomorrow's the lead team for us team lead. No, lead team. And are there any other announcements from everyone? I'd just like to say a, a big thank you to this wonderful music and media team for helping out this morning and getting things set up. We had kind of a last minute switch and everybody just jumped in and helped in, in any way they could to make sure that we could have service today. So thank you all so much yeah. for jumping in the way that you did. And I just sat and watched them. <laughs> she cheered us on too. <laughs> Paula, go, go, Paula. Oh, I don't need a microphone. No, pretty loud. No, come up here. Come. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, Rob says to me, we haven't been to church in a month this morning. And I said, I know, but our church has been there, and they're going to be there for us, because they always are. Thank you. But more important, um... This morning I said a prayer to God. I said, I want the sermon to speak to me. And today, Michael, you gave a sermon that spoke to each and every one of us. It was probably one of the most intimate services I have ever had. And I thank you for that. And I know God heard my prayer because you shared so much of your life with us and you continue to share so much of your life with us. And in so many ways you touch us I was wondering why I had some Kleenex in my pocket today, and I'm so glad I didn't take it out and throw it away. But you change so many lives, whether it's our own or our children's or our families. I have to say, I remember when I was going in for brain surgery, you appeared. Rob was nervous as heck, and he didn't know what was happening, but you showed up, and I knew at that moment I was not alone because God had sent an angel to me. And you continue to be that angel for so many. So thank you, Michael, for your sermon, your amazing words, and that will be forever with me. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, thank God. Anybody else raise your hand, please? Thank you, Paula. That you, you touched me very, very deeply. Thank you. Loving God, bless us to go forth to serve you with joy, faith, and love. Bless us to share the very best we have and pass on the love we receive. Strengthen and assure us, for we are eager to reach out and help, but we do not always see and hear the needs of others. Bless our faith to make us whole and equip us to proclaim your good news. In this sanctuary, the healing has begun. Bless us to go forth and help heal others in your name, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, your son, we pray, amen. I see me.